was buried beneath thy shame. Would you stand as we worship? I could carry that kind of weight. It was my doom till I met you. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my doom till I met you. Then you called my name. glorious day now your mercy has saved my soul now your freedom is all that I know the old made new Jesus when I met you oh you called my name I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. I was broken, you were my healing, now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open, cause when you called my name, your glorious day. Oh, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness, into your glorious day. Oh, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave. glorious day. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. It is so good to be with you all this morning. As we continue to worship, I want to take a moment to read from John chapter 16, verse 22. Jesus says, so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. This morning we come into this place, we may come into this place with a heavy heart, with burdens that are weighing us down, but as we worship this morning, I invite you to rest in the joy of the Lord and to allow his love to remind us of the ultimate joy set before us and the promised return of our Lord Jesus, knowing that he walks alongside us in whatever it is that we are facing. God, this morning as we continue to worship, I just pray that we would be able to rest in your joy. God, that you would hold us up and that we could lift your name up in praise. Be with us as we continue to worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue worshiping this morning.
worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds a victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross. Then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. shelter. I was an orphan, but you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open. These are the powerful, powerful words that we sang earlier this morning. And this morning, if you're if you're feeling like you need rescued, your chains to be broken, if you need healing upon your life or your situation, we cry out to Jesus. We seek him and we run to him. 
Romans 10, 13 says, But everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So this morning we call upon the powerful name of Jesus. God, we recognize our need for you this morning. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to rescue, heal, and love us. We pray that chains would be broken, that hearts would be changed, and lives would be saved. God, would you be with us this morning? Would you remind us that you are with us in the midst of of our chains in the midst of our brokenness. God, you come and you heal us and you restore us. God, we just speak the name of Jesus this morning and ask that you would be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus cause your name is power your name is healing. Your name is love. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over fear and all anxiety To every soul held captive by depression I speak Jesus Cause your name is power Your name is He from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus Shout Jesus from the mountains Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Over every heart. 
heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within his presence I speak Jesus And death could not hold you The veil tore before you You silenced the boast of sin and grave The heavens are roaring The praise of your glory For you are raised to life again And you have no rival You have no equal is the glory yours is the name above all names what a powerful name it is what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a powerful name it is nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within his presence I speak Jesus Let's pray together. You could be seated if you'd like, or you can come to the altar, as always. <clears throat> Father, thank you so much for the transformation that takes place when you come into a heart. From beggars to royalty, from prisoners to freedom, from death to life. And I thank you, Jesus, that those things aren't just ideas that make us feel better. <laughs> that is reality. You are reality. All reality is defined by who you are and all that you've done. Those things are far more real than what we see with our eyes that will pass away someday. But what you've done and who you are and who you've created us to be will never pass away because of what you've done on the cross, because you rose again. Those things are all true. There is a transformation that has taken place and is taking place because of our connection with you, because your name is power. We know we have a part to play, Lord, and, and, and you know, forgive us when we get pulled away by the world, when we are deceived by Satan, and, and sometimes when our own choices just, we just wander. But we know and we place our faith in you. We have more faith in your strength than we do our weakness because we know what your word says. Your word says that you will transform us, that that work is yours. We're in partnership with you, but you will bring it to completion. You will bring it to completion. Sometimes it feels like we're standing still. When are we ever going to learn? When are we ever going to change? And yet we are when we're connected with you. And Lord, as, as we go throughout our days, as we go to our jobs and to the store and to our kids' schools, 
Lord, may people see you in us. Just as we're being who we are, being in love with you. As we're being who we are, abiding in you. You will use that. Because it's you they see. And may that create a hunger for you. And may people come to know you. Thank you for being here with us, Lord. Where would we be without your presence, your comfort, your guidance? Um, continue to speak to us this morning, Lord. We bring all of our, our hurts, our anxieties, our, our frustrations, our sadness to you this morning. We just want to empty our hearts of those things, Lord, and, and lay them at your feet and just be ready to fill our hearts with whatever you want to say to us this morning. So would you speak through Pastor Tim, through your word? Thank you. We are so grateful for all that you've done, that you are real, and that you are here now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Thank you guys for that song. What a great song. Speak the name of Jesus. Uh, you know, for thousands of years, people have spoken the name of Jesus in a prayer called uh, the Jesus Prayer, which is Jesus Christ have mercy on me. And it's something that you can say very quickly and uh, even a breath prayer. And so no matter where you find yourself, you're in struggle in a difficult moment, you can just simply say that prayer. And uh, we believe the Lord responds to that. So what a great, great way to speak the name of Jesus over, over our lives is so important. So I want, to I want to invite you to worship through the giving of your tithes and offerings. You have the boxes in the back where you can give those or you can give online as well. Also invite you to give us some information through the communication cards um, and would love to have find out what's going on. If there's a need you have, a prayer request, or just you want to say hi, uh, you can do that or let us know some information. Wednesday is the beginning of the Lenten season. Ash Wednesday is this Wednesday. So we have an Ash Wednesday service, in, which involves uh, the uh, placing of ashes on our forehead and the sign of a cross. And it is the beginning of the 40 days leading up to Easter. And it is a time in which we uh, try to do some spiritual emphasis and focus upon on how we can draw closer to the Lord. And so you're going to hear a lot about that on Wednesday and then next Sunday as well. But love to have you come to that service. It's one of the one of our favorite services we do every year, the Ash Wednesday service. There's also already a children's uh, Lenten guide in the back that Pastor Sarah has put together. So uh, it's for families and children as well. And so you can grab that and pick that up and begin that, uh, that uh, season that begins. Let's stand um, as we greet one another for a moment. You may be seated. The ladies are at our women's retreat. I've heard great things, great responses from that. Some of you were able to go down yesterday on our back, but it was a great time. So we appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to get, get away and to uh, let God speak to us in that way. So we continue to pray for them as they finish the retreat up. We're going to look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, kind of the last sermon we're going to focus on passion. Next week we'll begin, next Sunday we'll begin our, our Linton series, and uh, we're going to be talking about the Sermon on the Mount, really seeing how, how Jesus calls us to walk in the kingdom. So it's, a, it's a, we're looking forward to that. But uh, we're going to look at first, 2 Timothy, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning with verse 6. Timothy uh, was a co-worker of the Apostle Paul. He was a member of the church of Lystra, and uh, Paul went to that church and was so impressed with him that he took him along with him. Timothy was young, uh, and so Paul took him under his wing to be his uh, protege, and he was called him a son in the gospel, 
And uh, Paul would send Timothy to churches when he couldn't go, and he became one of Paul's most trusted uh, people. I trust him. I have no one like him, he says. And so Paul developed a very close relationship with Timothy over the years, and now Paul is in prison. He is facing a sentence of execution. It uh, Likely this letter he writes is probably one of the last letters he wrote before he was executed, and he wrote to Timothy. It's a very emotional letter. We don't get into all of that. If you read through that whole letter, you can see where Paul is really dealing with these, these, uh, his close relationship with Timothy and also facing some of the last days of his life. And so we're picking up 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Paul writes to Timothy, For this reason I remind you to fan into the flame into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid but gives us power love and self-discipline so do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me his prisoner rather join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God he has saved us And called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, um, because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. So the word of God for the people of God. So this is uh, the last time we'll be focusing on passion in this series. And one of the best ways to think about passion is through fire. Uh, We think about being fired up. People are passionate when they're fired up. We think about people having fire in their eyes or fire in their belly. Um, And so fire is this uh, often a one way to think about passion. And in this passage, Paul tells Timothy, fan into flame the gift you have been given. Fan it into flame. Be passionate about the gift that God has given you. And I think that's important. God has made us to be givers. He has made us to be givers. He has blessed us. We have been graced. Uh, We are children of Abraham in the faith. Abraham was blessed so that he could be a blessing. And we are called to be givers. We are called to be people who have been given. And so we are called to give that out. Paul says in in Ephesians chapter 2, a great verse, we are God's handiwork. We are God's masterpiece. Uh, Created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. He has has created us in Christ Jesus. He has saved us, as Paul talks to Timothy, for his purposes. He has saved us to be people of grace, to be people who are giving, to be people who have been been prepared and are ready to do those good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Do we believe that? The idea that every day God has good works for us to do. That he has given us and blessed us in a way that we can be able to be a giver. That we are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do those good works every day. That should change the way we look at life. We should look at life with the expectation that there's something good that he is calling us to do today. And so the divine, the interruptions that we have are not interruptions, they are opportunities. The encounters we have are opportunities. The struggles we have are opportunities. They are all opportunities to see what God calls us to do in that day. It should change the way we live. And so Paul says, Timothy, you have been given a gift, just as all of us have been given a gift. All of us have been given a gift in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. All of us have been given a gift. You have been given a gift. Now be passionate about that gift. Fan into flame. He tells tells Timothy, let it blaze. (laughs) Do not be afraid. Now, Timothy, it seems to have been a timid soul. 
It seems Timothy had struggled with confidence. I don't know if any of you struggle with confidence. Most of us struggle in some ways with confidence in areas of our life. Timothy would understand that. Timothy struggled with that. Paul writes many words to Timothy, which basically try to tell him, hey, you need to be confident. You need to be, have faith in the Lord. He says at one point, don't let people look down on you because you are young. Instead, just set an example. Don't, don't get caught up because you are young. Timothy is being sent into difficult situations and uh, people speaking to people who are older than him, who have more experience than him. And Timothy, Paul wants Timothy to go with confidence. Don't let them look down on because you are young. Um, Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. Paul sent Timothy to the Corinthian church, and that was a very difficult church, full of conflict. Paul had all kinds of trouble with that church. And so when Paul sent Timothy to him, he writes to the Corinthian people, he says, when Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear. <laughs> see to it that he is carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am, so no one should treat him with contempt, and when you send him on his way, I want you to send him on with peace. Timothy, Paul is just, you can see, Paul is concerned a little bit about Timothy when he sends him there. And he says, I want you guys to treat him well. And so in this passage, Paul says, Timothy, you have not been given a spirit of timidity, of fear. And so you can see that Paul is really bringing that out. Don't let fear Push your gift down. Don't let fear make you afraid to allow your gift to blaze. You let your gift fan it into flame. Allow your gift to be realized. Don't back away out of fear. So many the ways we look at ourselves define so often of how we are going to live our life. And Paul wants Timothy to know that God has gifted him. And God has a call for him to, to do those gifts, to respond in those gifts. And so fan into flame the gift that you have been given. Don't diminish it. Don't hide it away. Don't be afraid. Fan it into flame. Because you have not been given a spirit of fear, but you have been given a spirit of power, and of love, and of self-discipline, or a sound mind. I want to look at these three quickly. God has given you a spirit of power. He has not given you, Timothy, a spirit of weakness, and that's very important. The Holy Spirit in us gives us a spirit of power. Some social commentators are very concerned that our society is creating a group of fragile people, that we are not encouraging people to be strong, to be resilient. And one of the reasons they say we are doing that is because we are shielding people from all problems and difficulties. We've always heard for a long time about the helicopter parents who kind of oversee their children and protect them from any hardship at all. I'm, I'm sure if you're a teacher, you've had to deal with, with, uh, with parents who sometimes want to come in and, and save their child a little more than maybe they should. But, but there is that concern that we have protected children so much, we've protected ourselves too much, shielded ourselves too much from any hardship, and therefore we are not resilient anymore. A group of researchers wanted to find out why there are so many peanut allergies today. I don't know if this is, I've not done a study about this, but this is what they did a study. Uh, so they took two groups of infants, and half of them were exposed to peanuts at a young age, and the other half were not. And the groups that were not exposed and we're five times more likely to have peanut allergies in the group that was exposed to peanuts. So rather than weakening children, exposure to threat actually strengthened them. A lack of exposure actually weakened them. Now, I don't know about peanut allergies, but I think that is absolutely true in the area of hardships and struggles. The Bible talks a lot about when we go through hardships, it produces perseverance strength it produces perseverance and strength in us Timothy you have been given a spirit of power you've not been given a spirit of fear you've been given a, sp a spirit of power so fan into flame the gift that you have been given don't be afraid uh, you know from a young age we learn that blowing on a candle 
will extinguish a fire. And so we think that to protect a fire, we need to shelter it from the wind. But of course, that's exactly the opposite, right? The wind actually grows a fire, not a candle. A candle, it will, it will blow it out because the, the, the wind we blow onto it cools it so quickly. It's not that big of a flame. It'll cool down quickly and it'll go out. But, but, but you take a, a fire that's any size and you, you bring wind into it, and it will not blow it out. It will, it will build it up. It will make it bigger. It will infuse oxygen into it. Timothy, is, Paul is saying to Timothy, you're not, a, you're not a candle going around like this all the time, worried that the fire is going to go out. Uh, you don't think you need to protect it from the wind. Instead, the headwinds will come. It's only going to fan the flame. Fan the flame. And so I think one of the things that, that we are called to do is, is to not allow the fear of hardships to cause us to grow apathy, apathetic. That one of the reasons we can lose our passion is because we don't want to deal with problems. We don't want to deal with hardships. We, we sometimes, uh, we, we use apathy as a way of coping with stress. I don't want to try. I don't want to put myself on the line. I know what happens when you put yourself on the line. You end up with problems. You end up with difficulties. You end up with people who are standing against you, people who oppose you. If you let your passion out, who knows what could happen, right? So I don't want to put myself on the line, and therefore, I just, I'm just not going to care about as much. I'm going to allow apathy. I'm just going to give in to apathy as a self-protection method, strategy. Because I don't want to expose myself to anything uncomfortable. And when I do that, my protective bubble gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and that's, that's one thing we have to think about. Are, are we getting too comfortable? Are we getting too comfortable in our life? Are we getting too comfortable in our life so that we're never pushed out on the edge? Um, that, because we don't want to deal with difficulties. Paul says, fan into flame the gift that you have been given. That, that's going to mean, Timothy, you're going you're to push out into new territory. You're going you're gonna to step out and do something. When we are givers, we are people who are, who are often putting ourselves on the line in some ways. Um, and so, so, so don't be afraid. Don't be afraid because you've been given a spirit of power, not weakness. That hardship that's coming, you're going to overcome it. Don't, don't put that protective bubble so that you never want to put yourself in uncomfortable positions. If you do that, you're never going to grow. You're never going to be on the growing edge. If you want to be on the growing edge, if you want to be, uh, allow God to, to work in your life, you've got to be able to accept that you're going to be put in uncomfortable positions from time to time. Don't be afraid of the winds of hardship that may come. God will use that to fan the flame. Don't be afraid of making a mistake. <laughs> I read somewhere, uh, someone talked about those people who never want to make a mistake, but because they never want to make a mistake, they never venture out. And they call them fragile perfects. <laughs> they, they, they can't handle making a mistake. themselves off. But, but we can't let that happen. I mean, babies give us a great example. I mean, I think about babies. Uh, they make mistakes all the time, but we don't look at them as mistakes, do we? I mean, they walk, and how many times they fall down? We don't look at them and say, man, that baby is a terrible walker. No. We look at that and say, that babies, look at the courage. Look at, look at the persistence. Babies have a way of being persistent. They keep going. They keep sticking their finger, trying to stick their finger in that electric socket no matter how many times you tell them not to do it. They aren't tortured by their mistakes. And, and, and sometimes we can be that way. 
So don't let fear uh, cause us not to step out and be a giver. When God calls us to do something and it's, it makes us uncomfortable, like maybe we have to call someone up. I mean, I had this happen this week where I decided the Lord was talking to me to go talk to some people that I didn't know very well, but I saw them in a store, and so I went and talked to them, and it was, it was, I was awkward, and I tried to make a joke, and I think it didn't land. But the Lord is like, good, because you got to get over worrying about that. So go make another mistake, you know? That we, we, we don't have to be afraid like that. God will call us out. He'll call us to do something, and it's going to be uncomfortable. Um, I like it in the men's group. I, I can't remember who said this, uh, and, I, and I can't remember if they said it exactly this way, but we were talking about uh, you know, trying new things and trying to work on cars, and, and one, of the, one of the struggles that makes me not want to work on a car is I'm always afraid I'm going to break something worse. You know, That's what I'm worried about. I'm going to get in the middle of it, and I'm going to break something, and then I'm going to be in trouble. And I remember someone in the men's group said, don't worry, anything you get yourself into, we can get you out of. <laughs> and I thought that's, what, that's kind of what we need as the church, right? It's okay, we're going to be there. Step out. Fan into flame. Embrace adversity. It's going to happen. So what? Don't be timid, Timothy. Don't be afraid. Fan into flame the gift that you have been given. Because God is going to use you. And you have been given a spirit of power. You can overcome. You're not the weakling that has to keep yourself away from all difficulty because you're not going to be able to overcome it. Spirit is working in you, trust in God. You've been given a spirit of power. Fire uh, is powerful. Fan into the flame and let that fire uh, go. But we do need to fan in the flame. We need to have passion. We can overcome a lot of things with passion that we cannot overcome without it. So Paul says, you have been given a spirit of power. Don't be afraid, Timothy. You have been given the spirit of love which is really important. When we think about sharing our gifts with other people, when we think that God has actual things for us to do to, to impact people's lives, to be a part of his kingdom, when we think about that, we need to have a spirit of love. Our, our, our heart needs to be pure. Because sometimes there are people who want to help in the worst way. You know what I mean? <laughs> they help, but their help isn't helpful. That's what I mean by helping in the worst way. They, the motivation is them. I'm giving because I need to give, because I need to feel better about myself, and they, and they just have to do it when it really doesn't necessarily help a situation, but they have to do it because they're compelled to make themselves feel better by giving. But Timothy, you have been given a spirit of love. A spirit of love that purifies our heart, purifies our passion. Um, and that's really important. As we've been talking about passion, passion definitely is like fire. And one of the things about fire is that fire consumes. Fire is always hungry for fuel, looking for fuel, looking for something to burn up. Which is why early on in our lives, we were told never to play with fire. And in the same analogy, we should never play with our passions. We should be careful about the things that we grow passionate about, right? We should be careful about what we fall in love with. We should be careful about what we begin to think about too much, what we focus on. We should be careful what we fall in love with, our passions. Song of Solomon, uh, Song of Songs, chapter 8, verse 6, says this, Love is as strong as death. 
its passion unyielding as the grave. It burns like a blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be utterly scorned. I mean, what a word. He's talking about love, but he's really talking about passion. When, when, when passion can be all-consuming, burning like a blazing fire, like a mighty flame, where rivers cannot quench it, you can sell everything and you're not going to get rid of it, you're not going to give it away, you're going you're to give everything for it. And that is absolutely true. We've talked about that with passion, how passion can overwhelm us. And then we ended up selling everything for some passion that is going to destroy us. You know, we were made for love. We have that fire in us. It is looking for fuel. We are looking for something that gives us significance, that gives us meaning and purpose and joy. We have a fire in us looking for fuel, and we were made for God. That is who we were made for. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And when I love God that way, He orders my heart. He channels that fire. And so, Timothy, you have been given the power of love. The Holy Spirit works in us to purify our hearts, to purify our passions. I love the song, The Power of Your Love. Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed, renewed, flowing from the grace that I've found in you. Lord, I've come to know that the weaknesses I see in me will be stripped away by the power of your love. I love that song. We pray that all the time. Lord, Holy Spirit in us, would you purify these passions in my life? Would you purify uh, those in our hearts so that my love is centered upon you? There is power in purity of love, purity of heart. And that's absolutely, when we talk about the Sermon on the Mount beginning next week, that is where Jesus is going. He is going, I, I want to have people of a certain kind, with a certain kind of heart, who live a certain way. And we're going to talk about that. And when we go through the Lenten, uh, the whole Lenten guide, we're going to talk about Lenten practices that can help us align our passions with God's kingdom. But Paul writes to Timothy, you have been given a spirit of love. And then finally, you have been given a spirit of sound mind or self-discipline. Sound mind is probably a better translation for that verse. You've been given a, a, a spirit that that keeps you with a level head. Uh, that, that's part of what discipline is. Self-discipline is actually that. It is where I've got all this stuff going around me and, and I, can, I can keep level-headed. Um, Paul writes to Timothy these words, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Uh, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. It's interesting, itching ears. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. So, so Timothy, you, you, need to have, you need to keep your head. You need to have a sound mind. I mean, this is what we talked about when we talked about Abigail. You know, David, full of passion, and everything is, is cratering, and he's overwhelmed with emotion, and Abigail comes before him, and, and, uh, and he, 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 his mind gets recentered on who he is. Paul says, we have been given a spirit of sound mind. When the emotions are overwhelming, when everything is going chaotic, we do not have to give in to those emotions. We do not have to give in to the negative thinking that happens when we go that way. We can actually be transformed. Keep your head. Keep your mind. Paul was about to be executed. And, and Nero was about to, Nero was the, was the emperor, and he was about to, uh, to do this terrible persecution that was going to happen on Christianity. And a lot of people were leaving the Apostle Paul. A lot of people wouldn't have anything to do with Paul because he's in prison, and they're afraid of getting executed as well. And so people were leaving him. 
He writes this letter to Timothy. If you read the last chapter of it, he says, you know, come quickly to me, Timothy, because everyone's left me. Uh, Everyone's gone away from me. He says, at my first offense, no one was there to support me, but may it not be held against them because the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me, the message might be fully proclaimed that the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth and the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Paul said, yeah, there were, there were times when I was completely left alone, but the Lord stood by my side. Timothy, keep a level head. You've been given a spirit of a sound mind. You do not have to crater every time a hardship comes. Endure hardship. Put up with hardship. Be patient with it. Sit with those moments that are uncomfortable. You don't have to respond. You don't have to react. You can endure it. That's that's what patience is so much about. It means I'm going through something difficult, and everything in me wants to do this, but I'm not going to do this. I'm going to wait. I'm going to trust in the Lord in this moment. Every day, we, we face some level of hardship. And we're, the Lord has given us a spirit that is a sound mind. If we listen to the Abigail of the Holy Spirit, a sound mind. Viktor Frankl, we talked about him a couple weeks ago, the guy who was uh, in a Nazi prison camp, lost his family and made it out alive because he found meaning and purpose in life. And he said there are three things that make life meaningful. He said the first thing is creating. He talks about the artistic pursuit as a labor of love. I I think that partly is just giving, being a giver, having something to offer to the world. Waking up every morning and realize that the day doesn't exist just for me. It's for something bigger. You find meaning and purpose in that. And so creating. And the second thing he's talked about was experiencing. Experiencing love, experiencing a sense of awe, experiencing nature, wonder, being caught up with something bigger than yourselves in an experience. But the third thing is very interesting. Three things that make life meaningful. Creating, experiencing, and suffering. Suffering. Viktor Frankl knew something about suffering. But he talks about the authentic suffering. When it's authentic suffering, not the narcissistic kind of suffering that's about complaints and being upset that everything doesn't go your way, that's not what he's talking about. We we sometimes feel we're suffering when life doesn't go the way we want it to. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about suffering of an authentic way. And he said, when we go through suffering... It strips away our vanities. It strips away all those things that we think were important. And we begin to realize what really matters. And when we go through suffering, it has the opportunity to make us more compassionate toward people going through suffering. We begin to see what they're going through. And life becomes meaningful as we endure suffering. And it's absolutely true that when our suffering is surrendered to Christ, our sufferings somehow get caught up in what he is doing. We are in Christ, and our sufferings get caught up in the sufferings of Christ. And there's no greater purpose than that. So when we go through anything, we say, Lord, would you use this? Would you use this for your king glory? Would you use this to make me better? Would you use this to, to, to make me more compassion? I'm not saying, Lord, you caused this. I'm not saying I don't pray that it goes away, that all that stuff is appropriate. But in the midst of that, can I, can I connect with what's going on in my life to what you want to do in this world? Finding meaning, a, a sound mind. You've been given a sound mind in the midst of everything going chaotic. And and maybe even going through suffering. I can hear the Spirit giving me hope beyond what I'm going through. So Paul says, Timothy, you've been given a spirit of, don't be afraid, don't be timid, don't be hesitant. You've been given a spirit of power. 
So, so step out. You've been given a spirit of love. Your, your heart is going to be purified. The Holy Spirit wants to continue to purify your heart. And you've been given a spirit of sound mind so that in the midst of things, you don't have to be just a, 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 a leaf down the stream that follows your emotions wherever they go. You can actually allow the Spirit to give you guidance. Fan into flame the gift that you have been given. Each of us, God wants to call us out into this world to make a difference for him. How is our passion? How is the flame? Is life an adventure? Or is life boring? <laughs> because we've lost our sense of purpose. I heard one guy, he did an exercise for, for people, he gave them a blank card, three by five card or four by six, whatever, a blank card. And on one side, he said, I want you to answer this question. What gets you up in the morning? Alarm clock? <laughs> My back hurts? <laughs> Kids? I have to? What gets you up in the morning? The question really is, on an average day, what am I excited about? What am I passionate about? Now, if, if it's not an average day, if we're getting ready to go on a vacation, we know what we're passionate about. Um, but on an average day, what, what, am I, what am I getting up out of the bed for? What is the purpose in this day? How, someone has said, how we spend our days is how we spend our lives. So tomorrow morning, what are you getting up for? And, and he suggested people write down honestly what they're getting up out of the bed for. And then he said, then write down what you wish it was. What is my purpose? What do I see in this day? What am I getting excited about? Fan into flame the gift that you've been given. The other side of the card, he said, on the other side of the card, I want you to put down what keeps me up at night. What gets me up in the morning and what keeps me up at night. In the middle of the night, what am I thinking about? What am I obsessing about? What am I anxious about? What do I care about? What am I angry about? What do what I remember from the day before. What bothers me? And when I do that one, boy, I, it, it's convicting. Because <laughs> some of the most insignificant things can rate way up here, while some of the very challenging things that people are going through, the heartbreaking situations that people are going through, can be easily forgotten because it doesn't center around me. So what keeps you up at night? And, and you can begin to say, okay, well, here is really what keeps me up at night. Here is really what I'm obsessed about. But, but here's what I'd like to be focused on. Because you know what? If I get focused on those things, the important things of life, the significant things of life, if I carry those burdens and lose a sleepless night over it, then it's worth it, right? It's not worth losing a sleepless night over someone's comment or criticism, right? That's not worth it. But if I can give myself to things that matters, and if I can be caught up, then I can pray for those things, then my heart is more and more drawn to those things. Those are the things I'm focused on. So, so what are the things that keep us up at night? What are the things that get us up out of the bed in the morning? And what are the things that keep us up at night? Fan of the flame, the gift that God has given you. I'll end with this thought. This came from Women's Retreat. Someone sent me a text yesterday and told me what this uh, Crystal Watts said, which I thought was great. She asked them a question. What are the last three things that you've done that have been hard? What are some of the hard things that you have to do in life? Fan into flame the gift that you've been given. Maybe... The Lord wants to put you out there a bit. 
And what's hard for you is not hard for me. It's, it's not too hard. Well, it takes a lot of work to get up here and have something to say, but I don't get nervous about getting up here to say, but some of you it would be a big deal if you had to get up here and talk. But there's some things that you do very easily that I have a hard time doing. As we had in this Lenten season, what are the hard things? Maybe, maybe it's having someone over for dinner. Maybe that's a real hard thing for you to do. Reaching out to someone. Sharing your faith with someone. What is the hard thing? Fan into flame the gift that you have been given. When we do something that's a little bit out there and a little hard, it helps our prayer life because we pray before we do it. And it adds some excitement to life, a novelty to life, something different, something new something challenging, something we've never done before. May the Holy Spirit guide us to fan into flame the gift that he has been given and allow his power, his love, and his work in our life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you redeemed us by your grace for purposes you have set us aside to be holy, to be yours. You've given us a purpose from the reason, the moment we were saved, uh, to be yours. And Father, we pray, Lord, that your spirit would continue to transform us so that we would be the people that you call us to be. Help us, Father, to see what you are doing, what you are calling us to do, and get in on that as, as you lead us. And Father, may we, as we enter this Lenten season coming up, guide our minds and our hearts uh, that we would be engaged and what you're calling us to be engaged in. And we would disengage uh, from the things that we need to disengage. And uh, we just commit that time to you. And now we open our hearts to you anew this morning that the love of the Father and the life of Christ and the breath of the Spirit would quicken within us a greater affection for your ways. Work your will in us, Lord Christ. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace.